I'm Cheryl Brutvan, the Director of Curatorial Affairs and the Bailey Curator of Contemporary Art at the Norton Museum. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome Jose Alvarez so that we can speak about his art in his exhibit. Um, hi, Jose. Hi, Cheryl. Thanks for being here. And thank you for this fantastic exhibition of something so meaningful and so personal in many ways. Mm. Um, I wanted to first start talking about this amazing collage that we have in our collection, and yeah. it was really the impetus for having a, a larger exhibit that I organized called Altered States. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's such a characteristic work for that period mm -hmm. and includes so many materials that you've become known for and manipulating. But yeah. what, how, did you, how did you start? Why did you start making these fantastic collages and yeah. choosing these materials? Uh, the or origin of the materials came from readings that I was doing about a um, anthropologist. His name was Carlos Castaneda. And he had a big following, and uh, he had a shaman in Mexico that he went to visit um, in order to become a man of knowledge. And in order to become a man of knowledge, he needed to go into an alternative world. And he said that in order for him to, to encounter this world properly, he needed to have objects of power. And those objects of power were feathers, porcupine quills, and crystals. I read this when I was like 16, more or less. And they became like this source of imagery for me that I kept on working with throughout the years, and which also the name gave me the, the reference for a performance that I later called the Carlos Performance. And that's, I mean, for many people, when they see the collage, what they, they associate with is, oh, is this the performance artist, Carlos? Yeah. Which you had this entire career of performance art. Yeah, that was uh, I mean, early on yeah. in the 80s uh, and 90s. And, it, you know, I went all over the world doing this performance. And in, in this performance, I was uh, pretending to be a a channeler, which was like a big um, thing on um, television. And I decided to use the kind of uh, uh, elements that they were using, especially crystals, as uh, the emblem for the performance. As I was trying to move away from performance into more um, object- Object-oriented. Oriented. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was trying to see how I could transfer that into uh, an object, and I thought about a crystal painting. And then I talked to a geologist friend of mine, and he told me, I think what you would use, you would want to use is mica, because I said, I don't want the crystals to come out like this. I want it to be flat, almost like an all-over uh, Pollock painting, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and then he said, I think mica is what you want, and he sent me some samples, and, and when I opened it, and I saw the light coming from it, I said, ah, this is it. It became this kind of a very charged object. And that's how I started using mica. And then I layered upon it all the other elements that were within the writings of uh, Carlos Castaneda's. After a while, I was kind of uh, done with it because there was no much more that I could do. Um, and uh, a friend of mine died um, unexpectedly in New York, and that kind of put all of my uh, life uh, in, um, in a questioning state. So I started moving away from that performance, and then this kind of work started coming through very strongly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think initially it came out of uh, grief, but at the same time, it was a way of making the world better, I think. It's remarkable to hear the associations because we look at it in terms of these physical elements and I think exuberance mm -hmm. that I think every, every piece that I've seen that is your collage or mm -hmm. drawings mm -hmm. with these uh, natural elements such mm -hmm. as you know the porcupine quills yeah. or the feathers. Yeah. And, and the mica background, yeah. it just all does seem to have this 
uh, joyous association. Yeah. So, so magical. And, in, and, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think that in my life, the way that I have always uh, managed situations that are chaotic, or or if or when I have found myself in in times of adversity, the work always give me the the space where I can um, create meaning or structure it in a way that I can handle uh, the craziness outside. Mm -hmm. So the crazier the world gets, the more exuberant they get. This still is a very fulfilling medium for you because you mm -hmm. continue to make extraordinary collages mm -hmm. and drawings that include a variety of materials. I, I, at this moment, uh, when I saw this work, I was organizing an exhibit here mm -hmm. for the museum and called Altered States. Mm -hmm. And so we had this great opportunity to show your work in the context of other artists who were exploring yeah. a variety of um, exuberant dispositions. Mm -hmm. and, and you also did this amazing uh, mural mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. And it was during that time, though, that we had this other um, extraordinary event happened in your life. Yeah. And that's led to the, the chrome drawings and yeah. this exhibit. Um, I mean, yeah. I know I got a phone call and someone said, you know, what, what, did, I, what did I think you know, that Jose Alvarez had just been detained and I, mm -hmm. I was unaware. So maybe yeah. you should pick up the story. Yeah, um, yeah that was uh, uh, a few This is months. 2011. Yeah, um, it was... Uh, it was the craziest time of my life. Uh, uh, federal agents came to my home and took me to uh, the Chrome Detention Center, which is a, um, a detention center for illegal immigrants. And the reason for it was because um, I took false papers when I arrived in the United States. Um, no, when I arrived, actually, when, um, after studying at the Art Institute for a while, my visa was running out. I didn't want to go back. To Venezuela because I actually left there why? because of um, uh, persecution as a gay man. I, mm -hmm. uh, in the late seventies and early eighties, Venezuela was very, very violent against um, homosexual people. So I didn't, I didn't want to go back, and I thought that that was going to be like a kind of a temporary solution until I, you know, I stabilized myself. Unfortunately, it became you know, time went by and it became my life, so to mm -hmm. speak, mm -hmm. with having these false papers. And then, uh, and then they came and they took me. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they um, yeah, that's, that's how that happened. And then a whole page of my life started, which was, uh, which was um, pretty intense. Very intense. Well, you were so you were you were taken to Chrome and really didn't know what the next I didn't day know was going to anything. even look like. Right. And that's I don't think anyone can imagine what the experience or emotions are yeah. uh, when something like that happens. That's yeah. so unexpected. So, yeah. And and yet at the same time, I mean, I think reflecting on it, this is now ten years later. So it's yeah. we can look back at it and yeah. look at it maybe more objectively, but... You know, I was thinking about that a couple of days ago when I used to say uh, that this was the worst experience of my life, and it truly was really intense. But after all this year, I said, maybe it was one of the best in the sense that what I've learned about the human condition, about our, our own connectivity to another human being, about... about I mean, so many layers of information that otherwise I wouldn't have gotten. So I just see it like, um, yeah, it was an opportunity for me to, to embrace it and learn from it, that, you know? So those first days when you were at Crown, yeah. basically stripped of your identity, stripped yeah. of everything, yeah. you were also, as you reflected on this, when the, when the when first able to talk about it yeah. and what you were able to do there, you yeah. you mentioned that you were basically so depressed you couldn't get yourself out of bed, and right. that it was that it was someone in detention with you yeah. that encouraged you. Um, can we look at sure. that first portrait? Yes, uh, 
Mexico. I will show you. Jose, can you tell us more about what actually happened that, that morning that the agents came to your door? Sure, they came and uh, they showed me all the reasons why I was being uh, uh, taken to uh, this detention center. Randy was with me in the kitchen. He was very, very um, upset. Upset. He was very upset. Confused, yeah. Most likely too. And I just, I just held his hand and he said, "Don't worry, I'll be back this afternoon." Mm -hmm. I went back two months later. I mean, just, just crazy moments of intensity. But, uh, but little by little things, you just have to trust um, in the capacity for the thing to, to you know. To just to, evolve. Yeah. I mean, you had no control at that no, point. No, no. So you had to be at the mercy of or, or follow whatever rules yeah. were being given yeah. to you. And your yeah. identity was yeah. taken away yeah. and you became a a number right, in origin. Right, a complete number. And, yeah. and, you know, rightfully so, I mean, expectedly that you would, how, how one reacts to this kind of shock yeah. also well, was probably uh, new for you too. It's like, what, what <sighs> am I doing and how do I yeah. negotiate this I mean, this, this is, the, it was just, it was just crazy. But um, uh, initially my reaction to it was just sleeping. I just slept for hours, for days. And there was already like four days that I was just in my cot. And this guy, his name was Julio. He was a Brazilian guy who was there. And on the fourth day, he, he bought me and he said, uh, get up, get up, you can't do this. I'm like, what? He said, you cannot let uh, depression take over. You need to be a warrior. He said, what's your name? So I told him, he said, what do you do? I said, I'm an artist. He said, so why aren't you drawing? I'm like, what's up with this guy? Like, you know. Had you had any interaction with no, him no, no, before? No. He just decided Yo, he's he gonna just, like, try to. Yeah, he just saw me sleeping all the time. He said, no. Mm -hmm. So then he said, so why aren't you drawing? So he went to his cot and he brought uh, a piece of paper, this piece of paper and a pen. And a pen? Yeah. The, uh, Just a, a little. The little filler. You weren't filler. allowed a, a formal yeah. pen. Right. You had, it was the like filler. A little refill. Yeah, the refill. For yeah. safety. Per, yeah. Correct. So, uh, so he gave me that refill so I can draw him. And I did like, like a minute drawing quickly so I can get him off my back. But when I was drawing him, then Philip, who was uh, another guy there, came over and he said, I want to be drawn too. So I started drawing him and then Carlos from the kitchen came as well, and um, and he said, "I want to be drawn too." So while I'm have this group of people around me, other guys came over and and they are they are like all around me, and I'm drawing, and they are all telling stories of why they came to this country, how they came to this country, and they were the most harrowing, crazy stories mm -hmm. of of survival of. Uh, of hope, of, of resilience, of all kinds of things. And, and I was like, people need to know these stories. Mm -hmm. People need to hear these stories. And they were like, who is going to document our story? Nobody cares for us. Like, who is gonna come to mm -hmm. this space and ask us questions? Nobody. Mm -hmm. And then I was, you know, all throughout the building, they had like signage saying, no recording device to be used and there was even a message that said, lethal fork could be used. And I said, well, I don't have any recording device, but I can draw. Mm -hmm. So then that's how little by little this project started kind of germinating, where I said, I will document this. But this was not, it, it wasn't just documentation. I mean, no. And what it is, I mean, and this is what I think is the, you know, one of the powers of art yeah. is so evident here. Yeah. I mean, the, the meaning of this group of drawings yeah. and the reflection on your experience yeah. is just one element of this story yeah. of how many other people yeah. have stories that are equally heartbreaking. Yeah. 
and that you are able to establish some kind of rapport, yeah. which is not, I'm sure it wasn't so easy to be able to start doing this. I no. Mean, so, so you, you know, lucky, lucky you could draw. Yeah. And that, and that it was a likeness of someone and they agreed this is Also remember that it's there. a whole day where nothing happens there. So mm -hmm. anything that could interrupt the utter boredom mm -hmm. will, will foster curiosity or conversation. Uh -huh. So I, I had some kind of an advantage there in the sense that if anything out of getting out of the dread of the day, but little by little, as I drew more, they started getting more and more engaged with the project. They, they were more um, involved in the sense that they felt that their voices were going to be heard or that their life were not just, you know, uh, picking sugar or, mm -hmm. or that it's kind just, of thing. Yeah, the identity was going to be better known, the right. entire person, yes. not just this no, just person this detained with this number now. Correct. And that's the end of it. Correct. Right. So suddenly it had a force within that building mm -hmm. that drawing these portraits, uh, they were going to have a voice. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's the intention of it. You know, so what I did was I, I placed a phone call to my galleries, mm -hmm. Sarah Gablak, mm -hmm. and I told her what I was doing at the center. Mm -hmm. So she saw me that I was very distraught, and I think that she said it more in a way to kind of calm, calm, me, down. calm me down. Yeah, yeah. But, but she said, okay then, so you are in, this is your studio now. She said, you are there to, um, to do this. This is she almost said, your mission. Yeah. Though, isn't so it? she yeah. said, you are in the lineage of artists who have um, commenting and documenting social ills. You are doing this at this place now. Mm -hmm. And that made quite a change in my head that it wasn't, I wasn't in desperation anymore. I was working. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hung up and I said, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, I'm working. And so every day I would get up. And I said, I'm going to work. And it didn't matter how many days I was going to stay there, because I was working. Mm -hmm. And that was the frame of mind to, to do this. That was huge for that yes. shift in the it way It shifted completely at because doing. everything was towards that goal. And it's almost like your identity as an mm -hmm. artist returned yeah. instead of being defined by what had just happened to you yeah. in terms of this other concern and government and position yes. on your life. Yeah. But tell me about Julio so, and how did you, like as an artist, how yeah. did you approach this then? So Julio is the first one and this is yeah. done very quickly. You yeah. can see in the way you yeah. rendered it. Yeah. So how did that change over time? Well, over time, as you can see, the drawings start getting more uh, tighter and more complex because I felt that I needed to respect their um, likeness mm -hmm. more clearly. Mm -hmm. And then I started putting the drawings on the floor. And as how I much time has gone by as this is happening? So Julio, how long, you did this in an afternoon or? Oh no, that was, uh, that was in a moment. It was just a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there were two, two types of pen. This and this. There were just two colors. Blue and black. Yeah, that's it. And those are the ones that, you, that I use. Mm -hmm. But as I said, I was putting it on the floor to let them get familiar with, uh, the, what, with what, what I'm doing, doing because they would come yeah, yeah. and look and be like dismissive or, or joking or whatever. But yeah. other people would come and start asking me questions about it. Yeah. And the more I got to do their faces and they got to be more involved in it, the more they respected right. what they, I was doing. They, were, they wanted them to be part of it. Mm -hmm. So, so at first you had to convince them, and that's why you but I didn't. put your drawings right. I, I just, so I just, people could see what yeah, you were doing yeah. and, and start generating this. What, trust. You have to have trust and yeah. relationship yeah. because the idea of being in front of someone yeah. who is staring at yeah. you. Yeah, it's very intimate. And it's, intensely yeah. examining you in order to render is... Yeah. It's very personal. It's, it is, and it's a very homophobic you, environment as well. 
but little by little, just, just putting the drawings on the floor and be there willing to talk about them. Uh, and their lives. with them it's and a their vehicle lives. to really yeah. talk about so they the started experience. accepting it mm -hmm. you know but you and also you also decided that you needed to have the biography with yeah because at f b first i was drawing them and then there were f there were four of them that were taken at the time that i was drawing them. oh those are the ghosts that the we ghost have in the drawings. exhibit yeah so then i didn't have any any bio i didn't know who they were so you started drawing them and as you're drawing yeah agents come over and yeah they they me, just they just go. they and just said um i don't know guatemala 343 that was a number and that, and was, that was some individual and that will be he will be taken and deported so um so then i switch and i started asking their bio first and i will and you I would write it down. I would write so it all down. So these files are really from your yeah, conversation. Yeah, I, I, I have all the original handwritten notes. Mm. And then if I had only a trace, I, it didn't matter to me because I had the bio and they, that person was there and this is part of their face kind of mm -hmm. thing. So that's how I, I switched that. But I promised and I said, I promise you this, these drawings will be in a museum someday. The interesting thing is that at that time I said, where would that museum be? Patagonia? I didn't know. I was no, I didn't have any idea where I was going to be. But I felt that what I was doing had a lot of meaning. Mm -hmm. A meaning you know? to you and to each yeah, person? Yeah, to all of us. Were, yeah. were there people that you wanted to, you only drew people who wanted to be drawn? Yeah, obviously. Because uh, the they, were, they were, I mean, the guards also brought me photograph of family members or whatever that they wanted me to draw for them. And I said, just wait a little longer. I just need to finish some people here and I'll get to you. But my position was I was not going to draw my jailers. Mm -hmm. You were going to draw the individuals. Yeah, the other, people your, who were there. Your peers. Yeah. And so tell me more, how did you approach this thinking of it as an artist? So yeah. you, you have two different versions yeah. of, of Felipe. Felipe. But how, did yeah. you, how did you arrive at this? Did you just uh, yeah. intuitively know how to draw someone? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been doing portraits for a long time. That's something I did since I was a kid. It's just that through time, I, I literally left it behind. And I haven't drawn portraits, I don't know how long, until this. Hmm. And, and I was just, oh, man, <laughs> you know, to get back to observe like that and to draw like that. Very interesting, mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 in terms of what, what you take as an artist, what the person is doing. Um, Should we look? Yeah, yeah let, me, let, sure. me, let me show you um, a drawing over there okay. that I want to talk to you All about. Right, let's okay. look so tell me about Brahima. Brahima. Brahima was a very interesting. Um, uh, a, a situation that happened with me. I, I saw this guy who was sleeping constantly. He, for two months, he, will, he was sleeping. He would get to the cafeteria, eat, come back, and sleep. Mm -hmm. He would talk to no one. No one would talk to him. And I was just like, I want to draw him. So I went to him and I said, you know the project that I'm doing? And, um, and I would like to, to draw you. And he said, sure. So he sit down and I put it right in front of a, of a window. That's why he had all this light on it. And I just right next to the window. And I started drawing him. As I'm drawing him, I start seeing that uh, tears are coming out of his eyes. I'm like, oh man, what did I do here? Why, why is he crying? You know, so, so I'm going like, why are you crying? He goes, Keep drawing, man, keep drawing. So I touched his knee like this. I said, don't worry, it's gonna be fine. He said, keep drawing, man. So I said, okay. So I kept drawing, and then I had to stop. You always, your, your drawing sessions were never long. How long? How long was they, were, really? they could be like 10 minutes at one time, half an hour another time, 45 minutes another. So it all depends on the activity that the guys around you are not interrupting you. Because this is a whole bunch of people with nothing to do, 
guys with nothing to do. So if you are trying to find some quiet space to draw some, that is not going to happen. So they come and bug you and they do all kinds of things, but you have to be completely focused on what you're doing and erase everything else. So, um, so he told me to, to keep drawing and then the following day I, I stopped him again and I said, listen, I need to do some uh, more uh, touch-ups. Do you mind? And he said, no, but wait a minute. So he ran to his cut and he got a piece of paper and he brought it to me. He said, could you do one for my daughter? I said, of course. So I put it aside and I said, but you know that I have to ask you a question because this is what I'm doing for, me, for everyone. I said, why were you crying yesterday about when I started drawing? And he said, well, I never been drawn. But I think what he meant to say was, finally somebody uh, took me as a person. He was seeing me as a human being and not as a number, not as cargo, not as a nuisance that need to be get rid of, mm -hmm. but as an actual human being. That moment for me was tremendous in the sense of art as humanizer, but also for me art as savior and as hope. It was all of these things together you know, which before I never felt quite like that moment. I said, it does, it does change things, you know. Do you think that's also um, a reflection of, you know, getting into this artistic sense of, of the power of portraiture in particular? Mm -hmm. You know, how much we, how much we read into someone's portrait mm -hmm. as, as, much as trying to understand who that person is and the psychology of the person. I mean, that's something that comes out in the way you've rendered the people that you've well, looked at. Well, also because you are giving them the respect and the, the acknowledgement mm -hmm. in order to draw them. Right. You know, so uh, I feel that that relationship in itself is start establishing something there that that is beneficial. And you had, this is, as you told me, the, the installation of the drawings is based on when you, when you did the drawings. So the yeah, earliest how works the began. progression of. So yeah. this, so this, you know, and there's roughly 30, 30 drawings, mm -hmm. I think. So you managed 30 while mm -hmm. you were over a two month period. Mm -hmm. So it did take time to be it able takes, to, it, yeah. to complete each of them, yeah. get a biography, yeah. especially with this kind of, yeah. um, energy and activity yeah. constantly happening. Sometimes they would be moved between buildings and then I didn't have, so I have to wait until they come back to this building so I could ask them for the buy over. There were all kinds of little things that needed to be um, resolved. Yeah, you had but to navigate. Yeah, so. But so this is well, Brahim, as well into your stay there yeah. when you're looking at it. And, yeah. and even you know comparing to your drawing early on with Julio, yeah. there is a much uh, more considered and, and you know the sense of time invested in yeah. that really small elements and details mm -hmm. in the way you have rendered Brahim. I mean we, there's no doubt actually there's no doubt with any of the portraits that we would recognize who mm -hmm. these people mm -hmm. are, who mm -hmm. these men are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, could you show us, I know there's another person, Roberto, you wanted to talk yes. about. Let's look at Roberto. Roberto is here. Um, uh, and again, very distinctive yeah, character. He, yeah, he was an Indian, um, um, very short. Uh, he was one of the guys, if not the guy that I respected the most there. He left his home when he was around seven or so, and he moved into a, a farm, a nearby farm. And then he would go into a laundry list of all the vegetables that he knew how to plant and, and harvest. He said, and I know how to, onions, that, that. You know, he would go through all the laundry list of animals that he took care of. Uh, what do you need to do with each situation that you, I mean, he was so proud of all the things that he had done. And then, um, and then he told me that he went into this, uh, 
uh, military place where you, where you uh, where you go to the draft. Mm -hmm. And he went in there, and then he started talking about the first time that he had pants and shirts in his life, and he would he would talk about the crease of shirts that are ironed. He could go on for hours to talk about that crease here and here. And it was fascinating to hear such... Um, like sensitivity to... To such basic detail. things that we don't it think about. Granted. But for him was everything, mm -hmm. that his shirt had a crease. And, and then he would tell me about the time that he would go into these uh, soccer fields trying to find deflated balls because then he would cut the balls in half and use each half as a shoe. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like we have no notion of this kind of lack of everything, exactly. you know, yeah. And then, um, and then I just, I just heard his stories. Uh, he, he, he spoke like seven languages, like English, Spanish, and a whole bunch of um, different dialects. He put his two kids through medical school. He became like a, like a master crane um, uh, operator, mm -hmm. but he had no papers. Mm -hmm. And then after, I don't know how many years he was here, like 25 years or something, um, he was supported. Uh, but I... Um, but most of the people, that you portrayed, you believe most of them have been they, deported. Yeah, they were, they were only two that, that left. It was me and another guy, Johnny. And I think each story, I mean, there are some that are really um, even more upsetting because of the contribution mm -hmm. the individual was making or the number of years. And there's yeah. this one other gentleman, Luis, that also I find very um, moving because he, as you record, he was 70. Yeah when he's telling you and yeah. when you depict him. Yeah, he, he got himself a home in, um, in um, Key West, in the Keys. And he was a lobster fisherman, and he, that was his uh, business. Yeah. And then he would rent um, rooms to people. And then there was a couple there, that an American couple that got into um, you know, fights and things very domestic, frequently, domestic yeah. violence. So one time, one, uh, the lady got like really beat up. Mm -hmm. So he was taking care of her, like mending her wounds and things. And he said, you know, people are complaining. I really cannot have this kind of, um, yeah, you know, you situation here. Uh, this, this cannot really uh, go on. So she called immigration on him and they took him and then when he was there, I was telling him, but you can't fight it, you can't fight it. And he said, what am I gonna fight? I said, I'm 70. Because he didn't know anyone in Mexico. He's been here like for the last 30 years. He said, hey, I don't know anybody there, but he said, but I can't fight this. He said, I don't, I don't have the time. It's again, heartbreaking. Yeah. And I think, I think that was the other um, effect of this body of work for people who come and you see them reading every single biography and looking at these beautiful portraits mm -hmm. under difficult situation mm -hmm. that you've made them, mm -hmm. but that people have a better understanding of what the lives have been that we're, we're losing yeah. um, in the country. Jose, can you talk about the last day you were in Chrome. Did you know it was going to be your last day? No, I did not know. Um, I, uh, Randy, my husband, he, um, I would call him and he would say, um, you know, um, oh, things are looking good. But, and and I, I, I just told him, I said, you know what? It's better if you don't tell me anything. Because I don't you want. You don't want to get your hopes up. Right, I said. And people were working with lawyers. And yeah. You were, there was attention. Yeah, there. it just I said right now I just need to concentrate on what I'm doing here, and I don't want to be, like you know, emotionally like that. But then um, suddenly I hear uh, uh, the number 
Venezuela 737. And, um, and I, I was like, ah, because when they called you. Is it like a loudspeaker? Just no, just a guy at the entrance of the building just saying, Venezuela 737. And I was like, am I going to be deported? Because when they called you, that's, that was it. So um, I was drawing a guy, uh, the priest. <clears throat> and I went to the entrance of the building and said, what's up? And he, the guy goes, uh, you're going home. And I said, what home? He goes, you've been released. I got so nervous. It was just crazy. I, I started shaking all over. I could not pack any, not that I cared to pack anything from there. The only thing that I cared were the drawings. But I was just like in such a state that uh, my friend Adrian, uh, I said, do you want me to pack for you? And I said, yes, please. So they give you this bag that is like a, ne like a mesh, like a, like a military grade type of thing, where you just put your things in there. And, um, and as he was packing, I was being surrounded by all the guys. There were like 50 or 60 guys saying, don't forget the project. Don't forget. And I said, I promise you, I won't forget the project. And, and they were like hugging me, and uh, I mean, it was a really kind of emotional moment. Then they took me out of, out of this building in this chain link fence hallways, and it's three o'clock in the afternoon. No, it was like one o'clock in the afternoon, like sun, like really bright. And there is a moment where I call Randy and I say, I've been released. And he goes, I'm going there right away. And I said, don't, please, because it takes 12 hours to be processed. And he said, no, I'm going there now. And I said, fine, I can't argue with this right now. So I went up, and then I have a guard in front of me, a guard behind me. We're walking through this uh, chain link hallway, and I hear this tapping like this. And I turn around, and the building is this long building with all these windows throughout. And then all the guys are through in the windows just just going like this, and I'm like, this is just so, like, out of body experience completely. So I went in there, and then it definitely took about 12 hours for me to go from one place to another place where they are processing everything. At midnight, I leave finally the building with a little um, uh, bracelet that had all my information. And I wanted to have that bracelet here. So as I'm walking, I ask the guard who is in this in guard uh, um, hut, um, may, I, may I keep this? He says, no, that is federal property. I said, OK. And then at the end of the street, there was this uh, street light, because it was already like midnight. And this diminutive figure with a cane waiting underneath. And the guy said, you know that gentleman over there? He's been waiting there since 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, I know that. I know that. So I, I arrive. He holds my hand, and he goes, let's go home. I said, yes, Randy, let's go home. So we get into the car, and I open the, the window, and I put my head out. And I just wanted to feel the wind. I couldn't talk. I wanted to feel the wind. And then we arrive at a diner that he likes. And everything was bright and chromey. Everything was just this. Uh, it was such a contrast with chrome, which was everything was gray and matte. And this was chrome and shiny everywhere. And then they give me this menu with like 200 items. And I started laughing because the whole idea of choosing, to be able to choose where here you have, you, you know, just so much of it. And over there, there was none. And before getting there, there was no choosing. It was just what you needed to do to somehow make it better. So all those um, contrasts were quite interesting, but I feel that it was the film, the film that, uh, the documentary that they did about our lives, An Honest Liar, is mm -hmm. called. The documentary started playing not long after I was released. Because it was filmed during this whole it, time This period. whole it time. It preceded your detainment and then was completed during, yes. Right. So 
And it was about Randy. I was about, initially it was about Randy, and then it became about the two of us. But it's mostly yeah. about him, but it became right. about the two of us. Um, going oh, that whole year in um, the premieres, of the, the, premieres of the film and talking to people and seeing how much love and reception and, and, uh, and enthusiasm for a whole year was what built myself back up. I think that without the film, I don't think I would be where I am now. Mm -hmm. But it was all that intensity that year that finally healed me. And then obviously, I mean, everything else that have happened. But also throughout. you commented when you see people in this exhibit, even recently, yeah. the effect that has on you. Yeah, because uh, I feel that, that uh, I have somehow uh, uh, made myself available to become, to become the person who was able to bring this out. I don't, in a strange way, I don't, I don't have ownership of this. I feel like all of us, we were with an energy to make ourselves heard. And I just contribute that way. You created the vehicle, though, yeah. for so many viewers yeah. who would never have known these people, yeah. ever, ever, yeah. Mm -hmm. to be able to have this experience of getting to know yeah. these 30 men. Yeah. And the experience of what it's like to try to, to have a thread, to weave something in your life where the place where you come from have nothing for you or your family, and you're just trying. You're just dying. 